In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O Good One. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy upon us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all ages. Light of light, true God of true God, begotten not created, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men him for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became man, and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and he ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. 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 Welcome to the Orthologia Orthodox Apologetics channel. You've probably already read the title on the screen. This is going to be our third and final video on Exodus, discussing the Glaphra and St. Cyril of Alexandria's Combinates. This is specifically Book 10, Volume 2 of the Glaphra. St. Cyril subtitled it Exodus Part 3. He wrote three books of the 13 books of the Glaphra dedicated to Exodus. So just to recap, as I just was saying, this is going to be the third and final video on Exodus, at least for now, based on the Glaphra. Uh, you can feel free to check out the previous two videos if I did, if you have not done so already. You know, in part two, our previous video, our last installment, we looked at how Holy Baptism, the Cross, and Holy Communion are foreshadowed or prefigured to us in Exodus in Types and Shadows. And we're going to continue with this theme of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, right? Exodus being Christological in nature. And we're going to turn to a few final examples of just how exactly Exodus is Christological and ought to be interpreted as such. So without further ado, that's enough of a recap on part two and part one. I'm going to make a brief introductory comment here. So we're talking about the Glaphra. I've made some comments about its composition, why St. Cyril wrote it. It was one of the first uh, exegetical works of the Old Testament he wrote during his time as Patriarch of Alexandria in between 412 and probably 420, most likely. Uh, later on in his uh, time as patriarch, he really took on the mantle of defending proper Christology in the wake of the Nestorian controversy. And he really focused a lot of his later years as patriarch defending proper Christology and refuting Nestorius, who is a heretic for us, right? He had improper, incorrect, heretical Christology. So, Glaphra means eloquent comments in English. I'm not going to repeat too much about what I said in previous videos, but, you know, just as a friendly reminder, again, the Glaphra is a thematic commentary, not verse by verse. So, you know, St. Cyril Alexandria makes a comment at the close of Book 10, where he mentions concerning wisdom and spirit and truth. Uh, this is a secondary commentary on the Pentateuch that he wrote, 17 books instead of 13, like the Glaphra. Uh, it's more likely to be verse by verse. From what I've heard, it really discusses some of the passages that are uh, not included in the Glaphra. Again, the Glaphra is thematic, not verse by verse, so uh, St. Cyril doesn't discuss absolutely everything, you know, but uh, that being said, it's a little difficult to find concerning wisdom in spirit and in truth, at least in the English language. I mean, I've had trouble f locating it in English. I found it in, I believe, French and possibly Latin as well, but that's probably not helpful for most of us. It would probably be better if we had it in English, but sometimes these uh, older works of the Church Fathers are not readily available in English, but you can find... Uh, dissertations and essays and other things that people have written concerning worship in spirit and truth, but finding the actual text itself written by St. Cyril in an English translation is a little bit more difficult than I thought it would be when I started the series. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of that. Like if you were looking for concerning worship in spirit and truth, then you know, you're having trouble finding that in English. Uh, I've had trouble finding it in English as well. So 
that's enough of a background. So let's get into our examples of how Exodus is Christological in nature. The first thing we're going to look at is concerning the rock that was struck. So St. Cyril writes the following at the beginning of Book 10. Now Israel was tested in many ways so that in their debilitating weakness might be manifested and that God might be admired for his great goodness and that he endured those who do wrong. And more so in that the mystery was portrayed to us in shadows in connection with each of the things that happened. Right, we said this before, uh, Christological, the Old Testament is Christological in nature, especially Exodus, the Pentateuch, right? Every book of the Old Testament talks about the Trinity and Divinity of Christ and tells of events to come in the New Testament, right? Uh, as we saw in the last video, uh, in Numbers, Moses prophesies of the day of Pentecost. So you see all these good things that are Christological in nature, foretelling of events to come in the New Testament times, right? Within the Old Testament, especially just the first five books of the Old Testament. And so as we were saying before in previous videos, there are many types and shadows. I mean, some things are a little bit more explicit than others, but even the incredibly explicit examples in the Old Testament of God literally coming and dwelling among Israel in some form, either in the form of fire, a pillar of cloud, whatever it may be, uh, Israel was slow and not always heeding the word of God. And I guess that's true of people at any time, right? There's going to be people that just don't go all in and commit fully to the one true God, right? So this specifically is Exodus 17, 1 to 7. Uh, there is also a parallel passage where Moses narrates the same story with a little bit uh, additional details in Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13. So basically in Exodus 17, 1 to 7, we read that Israel was putting God to the test. You know, they're wandering in the wilderness. They've already got in manna and quail. They're specifically near the rock of Horeb, okay? Uh, this is the wilderness of Horeb is near where the burning bush theophany occurred. And basically they're grumbling, they're complaining that they don't have water, but, you know, Jehovah Jireh, our God is the God who provides. He provided manna, he provided quail, despite the grumbling of the Israelites, he's going to provide for us. So if you need water to survive, God's going to provide you water, you just got to trust in him. So he was... Uh, in Exodus, right, it says Moses struck the rock at Horeb twice with his staff, so water would pour out to quench their thirst. So in the parallel account in Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 to 13, uh, we are narrated things a little bit differently. So in no the Numbers account, God literally appears to Israel and Moses, and everybody saw God, and Moses was told to speak to the rock, and Moses actually disobeyed God and struck it tight twice with his staff instead, and the water still poured out. But God was uh, angered at Moses because he did not have faith and trust the Lord and do what he said, right? The miracle was supposed to be Moses would speak to the rock, do exactly as God says, speak to the rock, and water would pour out of a rock. So in, in many ways, the Lord is spiritual water for our souls. We see this in 1 Corinthians 10 and the Apostle Paul. As I saw in our video on the fountain of living water, right? So the Lord Jesus Christ is spiritual water for our souls. He fills the broken cisterns of our souls in the desolate and waterless world we live in, the, delter, the wilderness, the desert, the barren wasteland. He provides for us. He provided manna and quail for Israel, as we discussed in part two. You know, and still the Israelites trembled and complained of the unending grace and mercy God showed to them. So we should not be ungrateful as the Israelites were, but thank and praise the Lord for that of which he has blessed us with. And we should not be overcome by the passions, but overcome them in fasting and prayer with the help of Jesus Christ. I'm actually going to quote 1 Corinthians 10, uh, just some verses beginning in verse 1. So Paul writes the following, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Okay, so this is very important. So we have a lot of things to pick up on. I've actually done a blog post on this, but basically in Exodus 14 and 15, and even the Song of Moses, uh, the father and son both appeared 
in a in the form of fire and a pillar of cloud, one in front, one behind. Israel led him through the water of the Red Sea, drowned the Egyptians and Pharaoh and his army and his chariots and all the horses. Right, the father and son work together, as Saint Cecil of Alexandria comments on First Corinthians. All God befitting actions are from the father and son through the Holy Spirit. The father and son work together in unison with the Holy Spirit. It's very difficult to speak of actions of one hypostasis in the absence of the other, because God is one after all, three persons, three hypostases, right? But one Uza, one essence, you know, one triune Godhead, one triune God. So we see that, that's uh, the reference to Exodus 15 when they passed through the sea, right? That's literally God was doing that for them. God was there with them and the Father and Son were both there. Moses in the cloud and in the sea, right? Uh, if I recall correctly, the cloud was in front. Uh, there was a cloud in front and fire in the back, right? Or one and the other. One was the Father, one was the Son, or as some of the ancient Jews like to call it, sometimes they would call it the heavenly Yahweh and the earthly Yahweh or visible Yahweh. Again, that's just to distinguish between the Father and Son, two distinct divine hypostases or persons who are both consubstantial and co-eternal. Uh, this is comparable to what Saint Justin Martyr, Saint Justin the Philosopher says that the Son is the visible image of the ineffable and invisible Father, the express image and seal as we read in Haggai, right? And also as we read in John 1.18, that the Son eternally wills to reveal the Father to us, and in Theophanies it is the Son of whom man is seen. So basically, we don't see God directly face to face. The God of whom men see in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God, but not the Father. So I digress, but that's really important to keep in mind. This unity, this harmonization, you see the Trinity on full display in full effect. And just again, the spiritual food all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of the spiritual rock. Again, we saw St. Cyril of Andrea saying the rock can be a connection to Christ as the chief cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. He is the firm foundation as God. He is unmovable, unbreakable. The rock can also be speaking to the Godhead itself, the divine essence, right? The divine nature of Jesus Christ, that he is in truth and by nature God. He's eternally Lord and God, as St. Cyril of Alexandria loves to say in his commentary on the Gospel of John, right? And, you know, the rock followed them. The rock was literally in the desert. You know, Christ was literally wise to us. Christ is amongst us. He is and he always shall be. And, you know, and the bodies were scattered in the wilderness and most of them were pleased as you're going to see, right? With the manna and quail, they picked out, they treated it like an all-you-can-eat buffet. And even that, as we're going to see later on in this video, you have the golden calf. Many of them commit idolatry. This anger is God. You know, God has to actualize and enact divine justice. He can't lend unrepented sin go unpunished, especially if it was malicious, intentional in nature, and not accidental, you know, no sincere repentance, right? It's an affront to God. Idolatry is never good. So, uh, I mean, I think that's enough about concerning the rock that was struck, and you see how it's Christ's eloquent in nature. It connects to the Old Testament theophanies in light of what we read in the Gospel of John and elsewhere in the epistles, right? You see the harmonization of John the Evangelist, of Paul the Apostle, of St. Cyril of Alexandria, connect, interconnecting with Moses, right? Prophet Moses, and uh, Haggai, and even the Psalms as well, and all these uh, Old Testament passages, right? The harmonization of Scripture. So I think that's really important. Again, there's Exodus 17, 1 to 7, and Numbers 21 to 13. You know, again, it's really important. Just as a final note, Moses was actually supposed to speak to the rock. He struck it twice with his staff. This is actually one of the reasons why, as Christians, we believe Moses did not actually enter the Promised Land. His punishment was he led Israel to the doorstep of the Promised Land. But Joshua, who was his spiritual successor and took over the mantle role of leadership of Israel, actually led the Israelites into the Promised Land after Moses' death at the close of Deuteronomy. So that's enough digression. I hope that example was good. Let me know if you have any questions in the comment, but we're going to move on to our next example. So we're actually going to talk about concerning the descent of God upon Mount Sinai and Israel before the mountain. This is a lengthier passage uh, subdivided into actually two different uh, exegetical passages by St. Cyril of Alexandria. But the important thing to remember is God literally descended upon Mount Sinai in the form of fire. This is God the Son, 
right? God the Son is the lawgiver. The Son of God is the lawgiver. Jesus is God. You know, he engraves the law in our hearts. He engraved the law on the tablets for Moses. Again, the law does not save. In fact, it is powerless to save, you know, as the Savior himself tells us in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except me. Jesus Christ is the literal door of salvation, the bridge to salvation. He is the only way to come before the Father and enter into perfect communion with the all-holy and constant trinity. Jesus is God, you know, he's the Lord of all, and in believing in him, we have life eternal. So in Exodus 19, verses 10 to 13, God tells us that God is literally going to appear on Mount Sinai. You know, this could be the Father saying that he's going to send the Son, who is also God, and the Son is going to appear on Mount Sinai. Again, you see this all the time, right? Sometimes it's the Son speaking in the Old Testament, sometimes it's the Father. But in almost every single case, every single theophany, the God of whom appears to mankind, whether it's individual prophets, Israel itself, is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ. So God is going to appear on Mount Sinai and converse with Moses. Israel is going to see him. So the Father is going to send the Son, who gives the law to Moses. The Son gives the law to Moses. And more specifically, verses 16 to 19 of chapter 19 tells us that God ascended in the form of appearance of fire, just as he appeared in the form of fire in the burning bush, just as the fire appeared and guided the Israelites in the wilderness, and the Father was in the form of cloud. Uh, the Father actually, many would say that the Father appears to Job at the close of Job in Job 38 to 41 in the form of a whirlwind. That's actually Job speaking to the Father, some people would say. But he, he, what he views is just a cloud and hears the voice of God. He doesn't actually see God the Father face to face. O only Jesus Christ the Son has done that because Jesus is God. And, you know, even so, the Israelites are afraid to look at God in the form of fire. As Moses looked and beheld God and was our mediator and saw God the Son face to face, so they buried their faces in the ground, but nonetheless, the Israelites who were with Moses heard him at Mount Sinai. God did literally appear physically in this theophany in the form of fire, and you know, specifically, the Lord descended on the third day in the form of fire, just as he rises again on the third day for the Lord's resurrection. However, unlike the days of Moses, all were free to behold the Lord in the incarnation and not learn to approach with the fear of God, for that of which Moses approached in the pillar of God on fire on Mount Sinai was holy ground. Right again, when the Son of God descends on Mount Sinai, that's holy ground. Remove your true shoes for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. That's also what you read in Judges 5. Okay, the commander of the Lord's army. Uh, Exodus 3 in the burning bush theophany. We also see that here. Right. So again, uh, one, the Israelites were afraid to look upon God. They knew it was literally God. They were afraid. They didn't think they were worthy. They had fear and reverence for God. But God also told them, like, hey, like approaching with fear and reverence, like I'm holy, I'm God, like you shouldn't just casually behold me. Like Moses had the fear of God inside him. He was righteous. He was pure, just like Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and Noah and the other patriarchs in Genesis, even Joseph himself. And, you know, uh, I think this is a really good quote that this is kind of a summarization in the secondary passage on concerning the descent of God upon Mount Sinai and Israel before the mountain. I'm just going to elaborate on one of them. They're both very similar, just a little bit more explanation. But this is a really important key passage for St. Cyril of Alexandria within the book of Exodus. So St. Cyril writes the following. So in Christ we have been called to the heavenly city, and we have been made worthy of the attention of God the Father. And through Christ and in him we have been taught to worship God the Father, the creator of all. And the Lord declared this also to us beforehand in a figurative manner. For the God of all did indeed come down in the form of fire upon Mount Sinai and minister to the Israelites those laws through which they should most properly have attained original righteousness. For the law was as it were a way of entering into more perfect things, consistent of both rudiments and participations of the teachings given through Christ. Uh, this is actually what St. Cyril of Alexandria, uh, Theodore of Cyrus, and others say on Zechariah 11, 7 to 8, which I did a video on, I believe, a vlog post on, right? The law is there to shepherd and guide Israel into the advent of the Messiah, you know, prophets, priests, and kings, the trifecta, if you will, of shepherding in the Old Testament, uh, imperfect uh, typologies of the one true shepherd, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Word of the Lord, the member of the Logos, who is going to come in the flesh and dwell among Israel in Zion, for Christ is amongst us, he is, and he always shall be. Okay. God, the, the Son, literally appeared in the form of fire upon Mount Sinai for St. Justin Martyr. God, the Son, literally appeared in the form of fire in the burning bush theophany. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria concurs. Many other church fathers agree that the 
burning bush, theophany, is literally the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, appearing in the form of fire and speaking to Moses. That's actually a common theme in the patristic testimony, the patristic writings of our saints and clergy. So that's enough. I hope that's important to understand that God literally appears. The descent of God upon Mount Sinai is real before the mountain is literally another theophany in Exodus. God the Son literally appears yet again in the form of fire to Moses, and Israel actually bears witness to this time and hears the Son of God speaking to Moses and addressing them directly. So that's always really important. Uh, we also have concerning the golden calf, as I was mentioning earlier, the golden calf made by Israel. So for St. Cyril, as I was saying before, with in regards to Zechariah 11, 7 to 8, again, we read the Old Testament holistically. So stuff written in the 12, the 12 minor prophets, minor, not in terms of their less important. Minor just uh, means shorter in length relative to major prophets like Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the law shepherds and guides Israel, he uses the analogy of a rudder on a ship, and in the absence of the law entirely, Israel would very easily and be prone to fall into all manners of wickedness. But even with the law, Israel neglected the captains, that is, prophets, priests, and kings. Some priests, kings, and were better than others. And they are typologies of the coming Messiah, the same four, who would be the most perfect captain to steer guide the ship of Israel into all truth. The Messiah is the perfect priest, prophet, and king. Okay, he is the ultimate shepherd. As God, he is the one true shepherd that will shepherd and guide the flock forever. He, in his staff, he holds the two staffs, right? The old covenant and the new covenant, bridging them together, entering into the flock of Christ, the covenant over relationship with God, the Gentiles and the Jews alike, for you all one in Christ Jesus, as Paul tells us in Galatians 3. So in Exodus 32, 1-6, to uh, Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses, is listening to the Israelites and constructs a golden calf for idolatry out of pool jewelry. And uh, Israel, him, uh, I'm sorry, St. Cyril notes that Israel literally saw God, had seen him with the appearance, that is, had seen God with the appearance of fire upon Mount Sinai and heard his voice for themselves and had entreated Moses to act as their mediator. So... Like, shortly after literally seeing and hearing the Son of God in the form of fire on Mount Sinai, they have the golden calf incident. And specifically, they use jewelry like earrings, necklaces, rings, and all that. So earrings uh, are, in a way, because Israel ignored the words of God and fashioned for themselves images of demons to worship in rebellion to God. And so their final state was worse as the first, just as Jesus himself tells us in the Gospels. Okay, again, Moses is, uh, Jesus Christ is a prophet like Moses, and Moses, like Christ, intercedes for Israel and humbly asks God to be merciful to the idolatrous sinners deserving of retribution in much the same way that Christ has mercy upon us and does not destroy us as we deserve. And Moses destroys the golden calf, but uh, God decrees that 23,000, in fact, idolaters would face death, and those who cling to Moses and his teachings of the law over God, worship not the one true God. Moses distanced himself from Israel and the idolaters. He was righteous. He distanced, washed his hands, cleaned himself of the wrongdoing of Israel. You know, he even pitched his tent outside the camp. He focused on God and the faithful remnant of Israel that could be saved. Just as Jesus Christ himself calls all to repentance, desires the salvation of all, and has mercy upon his sheep, but he must actualize divine justice. Those who sincerely repent and follow Christ will be shown mercy. But those who reject Christ and do not sincerely follow him, not just in part, but the whole, will uh, not be shown mercy. In much the same way, we have the parable of the wedding. Invitees, those who are invited to the wedding and do not enter, right, because they remain in bondage to sin and death. But all those seeing can enter in as many as they want at any hour before death, before he returns, and enter into the wedding, the bridal feast of Christ, because Christ is our bridegroom, he betrothes us to the Father forever and ever, and he strips us of our earthly identity and makes us a new creation in Christ. We are all one, we are all new creations in Christ. We have crucified the flesh and its desires. You know, this is all really important. So the calf can actually be compared to some of the teachings of Jesus Christ in regards to uh, the New Testament, right? And also just one final point is the calf is literally an example of idolatry, right? The worshipping of idols, that which is not God, is deserving the same Latreo worship, Prescanio rendered to God alone, the one true God, the triune God, if you will. 
in much the same way that Jesus Christ removes idolatry, frees us from the body of sin and death, calls us away from the worship of false gods and goddesses who are really no gods at all, and to the worship of the one true God in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, as is uh, undeniably demonstrated by the lives and writings of our saints. So all these things are true, all these things are important. I hope this example has been helpful. Uh, feel free to comment if you have more questions you want me to elaborate any more. And one final example is concerning the veil over the face of Moses. So St. Cyril writes the following, that the law given to them through Moses was utterly unprofitable due to their great lack of understanding. Christ himself proved to us when he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that testify of them of me, yet you do not wish to come to me that you may have life, is what you read in John 5, 39 to 40. Uh, this is on page 120 through near the end of book 10. So again, uh, John 4, 46, uh, Moses wrote of me, uh, John 8, 56 to 58, Abraham rejoiced to see my glad day and, is, and would, would be glad and uh, before Abraham was, I am. Okay, you see all these things. Christ is eternal, he's and he's uncreated, the eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, and so on and so forth. He is God. And, you know, even Bavli Sanhedrin 99a of the Talmud agrees that the prophets were sent not but to testify of the coming of the Messiah, the Holy One of God, the Anointed One, right? The Holy One of Israel. Okay, so St. Cyril actually connects this to Exodus 34, 27 to 35, the glorification of Moses' face after he received the law on Mount Sinai. Moses didn't realize it at first, but Israelites were startled because Moses' face was glorified and shone exceedingly bright. So Moses actually put a veil over his face, uh, removed it when speaking to God directly, and was transfo uh, transformed in some sense by participating in the divine energy of God. He did not become God. He did not become uh, God in any way, shape, or form. He was still an earthly prophet sent by the one true God, an ordinary man called by God to be extraordinary. But his face was transfigured as sort of a prefiguration of Jesus Christ and the transfiguration, hence why Jesus Christ is also the prophet like Moses, and Jesus Christ is also transfigured on the mountain and his face shone exceedingly bright. You know, great is the mystery of godliness, okay? And that of the divine truth revealed to us by the Lord of all. Moses was illuminated physically as well as spiritually, right? His face is made exceedingly bright, it's shown bright. Spiritually, the eyes of his soul were opened to the eyes of the unseen realm of the heavenly and celestial abode and brought into the understanding of the holy things of God, which he strove to impart on his fellow Israelites. Moses was the most holy, pure, and righteous teacher. So in much the same way, Christ is the mediator between God and man. He is the bridge that connects us, that connects God to mankind and reveals unto us the holy things of God and leads us into all truth. You know, the law is not but a shadow of the things to come, and just as Moses was revealed, the spiritual law by God, so too does Christ move the veil from our hearts and eyes and lead us to the spiritual Torah, which is engraved and written in our hearts. You know, we are sanctified and purified indeed through Christ and led into all truth by the Holy Spirit. And as I say, it is also comparable to the transfiguration of Christ in the Gospels. So this is just the veil of the face of Moses, a little bit short chapter, a little bit extra details by St. Cyril, but that's pretty much the gist of what St. Cyril has to say on this verse. And just as a conclusion, uh, that's going to be it. That's all I have for you guys today. This concludes our comments on Exodus regarding the Glaphora. I hope these three videos have demonstrated that Exodus is indeed Christological in nature and ought to be interpreted accordingly. In the future, I'm going to be embarking on a new series on famous women of the Bible, starting with Blessed Hannah, the mother of Samuel. But before I start that new series on famous women of the Bible, I was just going to do a standalone video on just the Bible from an Orthodox perspective and addressing common uh, objections from Protestants and other denominations of Christians and uh, I, I guess even Unitarians, if you will, about how Orthodox Christians right, understand the Bible and why our view is considered less correct than others. So I, I just wanted to defend the Orthodox teachings regarding the Bible. Bible, why the beliefs we hold to are valid and not only valid and plausible, but make perfect sense and are uh, correct. And so that's enough. I don't want to digress into too much detail. Uh, I'll probably make this video next week and then get started on a video on Hannah. The video on Hannah is going to be uh, based on J St. John Chrysotome and his Old Testament homilies. 
So he had five total homilies on Hannah, and there was technically a six, according to some of our clergy and scholars, but the sixth homily on Hannah has been lost, so we technically only have five homilies on Hannah that have survived, but that's still plenty to do a good video for you guys on Hannah, together with the homilies of St. John Chrysostom and the biblical text for us to unpack. So thank you as always for watching, God bless, and have a great day.